Good morning and welcome to 248 USB 1. My name is Arminio and I'll be the presenter for this class. What do we want to get from this class? Well, first of all, we wanted to understand the basic concepts of USB 2.0. And in order to do that, uh, we will see that being able to see and understand the traffic on the bus uh, while developing our application will be useful. So we will learn a little more about the protocol, the details of the protocol, and we will use uh, some bus analyzer like that uh, yellow box, sorry, that uh, silver box there in order to um, see what's going on on the bus. We'll also see that uh, there's a way to get uh, a so-called certification for your project, meaning a statement that your design uh, does match with the official USB specification. We'll ask ourselves uh, what are the advantages of getting a specification, a certification, and how to go through the necessary steps. These uh, goals uh, translate roughly in this agenda. We will start uh, with a kind of a necessary evil, meaning the basic concepts and terminology and ideas uh, behind the USB 2.0. Then it gets interesting because uh, we will learn some more details uh, about the traffic on the bus uh, and we will get to actually see how a bus analyzer works, what are the features of the GUI and how we can use it. Then we will move uh, to the device enumeration. The enumeration is a process that starts as soon as you plug your device inside the uh, host or into the bus and uh, the device exchanges with the host some concepts, some so-called descriptors and finally, if everything goes well, it gets enumerated. It's the most uh, tricky process in the entire USB communication so we wanted to understand some details about it. When you plug a device inside uh, your host, uh, you will see that uh, there will be a pop-up uh, asking you to provide uh, a so-called Windows driver or saying that the Windows driver is getting installed. What is a driver? We'll try to get some details about that. Then we will talk about uh, the device certification and we will have a wrap-up section where we will try to recap what we learned during the class and we will see what other classes uh, are offered during these masters for USB understanding. The whole session is uh, conceived as an open Q&A, so every time you have a question, just uh, raise your hand and ask away. There will also be a short break, like 15 minutes, probably by midway, as soon as we kind of feel uh, tired and willing to get a short break and a soda. So let's uh, start with the basic concepts. First of all, what does USB mean? It stands for Universal Serial Bus. It's a cable bus with a single master that's called the host and multiple peripherals that are called the devices. What gives to your design? First of all, uh, a unique connector for different type of devices. Back in the days, every time you wanted to add something to your computer, like a mouse, a keyboard, a printer, etc., you had to use differently shaped connectors and in some cases add some hardware to your computer. With USB, it's so-called the plug and play. All the burden is actually shifted from the user to the developer. So you, ha uh, you have only one type of connector and different type of devices that you can connect uh, to your host, uh, like for example, your laptop, uh, via this unique connector. It's also very easy to expand uh, using hubs uh, that are um, units uh, that let you add uh, some uh, ports uh, to the bus, for example, that uh, blue board uh, that is one of our embedded uh, hubs. It's also important to notice uh, that uh, USB is uh, standardized uh, through a mm, non-profit organization called the USB Implementers Forum, USB-IF for short, uh, that you can find at that address, www.usb.org. And uh, it's a bookmark you want to add to your uh, computer because uh, you can download uh, for free uh, from this website uh, uh, specifications and certification tools. 
as we said, uh, devices are basically the slaves on the USB bus. And the USB defines the two basic types of devices. The first one is the hub, like that blue board. The purpose is uh, to expand the bus, adding more attachment points that are called the ports. And the second type of device uh, is a function that uh, offers uh, communication capabilities, like for example, with a keyboard, with a printer, with uh, a mouse, uh, etc. And we have uh, different types uh, of uh, devices uh, implemented in our demo boards, uh, like the green one uh, that uh, you'll see there and that we will use uh, during our class. Both the type of devices hubs and functions are connected to the host in a topology that's called a tiered star. Basically, you start with the host that could be, for example, your laptop, and the host at the tier one has an embedded hub that's called the root hub that we symbolized with those red dots. And you can plug into that hub a mouse, for example, reaching a tier one, tier two and you can keep going with another hub uh, and maybe a monitor up to tier 7 uh, because of uh, timing limitations. So for example in this case uh, the hub uh, on the, the right uh, would be unnecessary because uh, being uh, in this example at tier 7 you won't be able to connect anything to it, anything working to it. Every device gets, uh, during the enumeration, during that initial process that happens when you plug in the device, uh, a unique address. Uh, this address uh, is between 1 and 127. So you can have up to 127 devices uh, plugged into your USB bus. This address is assigned by the host, uh, and address 0 is actually a reserved one that's initially given to the device, uh, as we will see during the enumeration process. Then uh, the host will give a unique address uh, to the device when this is configured. Also, uh, along with uh, the address, uh, every USB product needs a unique pair of identifiers, IDs. The first one is called VID, Vendor ID and you get that uh, from uh, the implementer forum. If you are a member of the forum, you get it along with your membership. Microchip is a member of the USB implementer forum, so it has a vendor ID that is 0x4d8. You can see the vendor ID of every device plugged into your laptop uh, using the device manager. So if you're using uh, a microchip device, uh, like for example, the Piki 3 you could be familiar with, uh, or any other of our demo boards uh, with our code loaded into it, uh, that's uh, the vendor ID that you're getting, 4D8 uh, hexadecimal. The other ID is the PID, product ID. Now, the requirement is that uh, every product that you do, not every single board, every product that you do, needs a unique uh, VID and PID pair. Microchip has uh, a free sub-licensing program, so basically we can let you share our VID and then give you a unique uh, PID for development and production up to 10K units. More than 10K units, uh, someone is making big bucks, uh, that means uh, that uh, you can go to the implementer forum and get your own VID and PID. And that's uh, the address where you can basically reach uh, a form that you fill in with your information and then you get uh, uh, contacted by someone uh, to actually get uh, your unique uh, PID. The USB is a cable bus, it's not wireless. You can uh, trip on the device and plug the bus, uh, but then it no longer works. So it's not wireless, it's a cable bus, uh, so it has uh, connectors. Back in the days, uh, there were two types of connectors. A type B connector that was upstream, meaning going to the host. All devices have a type B connector or a mini type B connector to save room. And it's the type of connector that you can find on our demo boards and on one of the ends of the bus analyzer. The other connector was the downstream connector of type A that was going to the device. 
And if you have a hub or if you have a computer, that's the type of connector that you are going to, to see. If you look at a, a typical uh, USB cable, like the white one over there, you can see at the two ends of uh, the cable the two different type of connectors, type A and type B. Last year, the USB implementer forum released the specifications for a new type of connector, a new kid on the block, uh, that's uh, the Type-C connector. Type-C connector is symmetrical and reversible, meaning that uh, there is no more difference between upstream and downstream, and you can actually flip upside down the connector and it still uh, plugs in because of the way it's internally wired. There's more match to it uh, with uh, the Type-C connector, and we actually have a class. Uh, at the end of the presentation, as you remember, we will see all the list uh, of the classes offered. There's a class uh, that goes uh, through the details of the Type-C connector and uh, how it can be useful, especially uh, if used uh, along with other uh, protocol, USB-related, like, for example, the power delivery protocol. The cable, per se, has uh, four wires inside. Uh, there is a differential twisted pair, D plus and D minus, that are used uh, to exchange data. And uh, there are two wires, V bus at 5 volt nominally, and the ground for power. So when we talk about uh, power, you have two, we have two different type of devices. A device can be bus powered if it's syncing current from V bus only. Only V bus is used uh, to get power to the device, and in this case, uh, the device can negotiate with the host during the enumeration up to 500 milliamps. Or a device can be self-powered if it's syncing current both from VBUS in theory and up to 100 milliamp and from an external power supply. I said in theory because it's kind of difficult to design a board dealing with two different power rails. So for a self-powered device, usually you choose to have the entire power supplied to the device using the external power supply, and no current is actually sank from VBUS. Still, you will need a connection to VBUS for a reason that we are going to see pretty soon. The USB was designed with the power saving in mind. So there is also a mode for the device that's called the suspend mode when only 2.5 milliamp max are sank from VBUS in order to save power. And the device needs to go into this mode if the bus is idle, if there is no communication on the bus for more than 3 milliseconds. And resume from this suspend mode as soon as there is a bus activity. Now remember that uh, the um, USB is uh, host centric, the host is the master, so the device cannot really do anything unless requested by the host. So what happens if the device needs to get out of the suspend mode, it cannot do it on its own. So there is a capability that's called the remote wake up that can be enabled by the host during enumeration and it lets you it lets a suspended device uh, signal the host uh, the need uh, to exit uh, from a suspend mode. Think, for example, to a mouse plugged into your laptop. The laptop goes into sleep mode and you want to wake up the um, laptop using your mouse. What you do is basically to start shaking the mouse. The mouse sends a request to the host, the laptop, to get out of suspend mode. And if the host acknowledges that, then it can receive data from the mouse. Talking about the communication over that differential pair, D plus and D minus, there are three bit rates. The first one is, is called the low speed, LS for short, and it's 1.5 megabyte, megabit per second. The second one is a full speed, FS, 12, megabit per second, and the third one is a high speed HS 480 megabit per second. If you are familiar with our PIC microcontrollers, uh, you know that uh, we have basically three big families, 8-bit, 16-bit, and 32-bit. Uh, um, all the families uh, support uh, low speed and full speed, but if you wanted to go high speed, uh, you need uh, to go with the 32-bit family. 
there are two observations about uh, the bit rates. We are talking about bit rate, not actually data rate, not payload rate. It's going to be less, uh, in some cases, way less uh, than uh, the bit rate uh, on uh, D plus and D minus uh, because of the protocol overhead. One of the reasons why we wanted to use a protocol analyzer that kind of uh, digest uh, the data for us uh, is because uh, if you just uh, follow the bit stream on the bus, uh, it's really difficult uh, to see the actual packets uh, being exchanged. There is uh, a lot of protocol overhead. So that's one reason why the payload uh, transfer is less than uh, the bit rate. And the second reason is bus uh, sharing. As we said, uh, you can have up to 127 devices uh, uh, plugged into your bus and they're all uh, sharing uh, the, the bus uh, bandwidth. The other observation is, okay, uh, between low speed and full speed, uh, and high speed then, uh, there is quite a difference of uh, speed. So if I have a high speed uh, bus and I'm plugging, for example, a full speed device into it, what does it happen? Does the full speed device bring down uh, the speed of the entire bus? That doesn't happen because of a capability of the halves uh, to separate uh, low speed, full speed, uh, and uh, high speed communication using a mechanism that we'll see and it's called the split transaction. So what happens is uh, when you plug uh, your full speed device, uh, for example, into a hub, the communication between the device and the hub will be full speed, but the communication between the hub and the host will be high speed. So no concern, you are not going to bring down uh, the speed of the entire bus. How does the uh, hub detect uh, the connection of the device and the speed of the device? Pull-ups are used uh, on either D plus or D minus, uh, um, and these uh, pull-ups to 3.3 volt are enabled uh, as soon as the device uh, detects uh, B bus. And that's the reason why, as I was saying, uh, when you have a self-powered device that's getting power from an external power supply, still there is a connection to B bus because uh, per USB specification, uh, you need to sense a voltage on B bus uh, before enabling the pull up on either D plus or D minus uh, to avoid back powering the host. So for example, a low speed device uh, will have uh, a pull up uh, on D minus uh, and uh, a full speed device uh, will have uh, a pull up uh, on D plus. Uh, high speed devices are also having a pull up on uh, D plus uh, and uh, there will be a signaling protocol called the chirp uh, between the device and the host uh, to figure out if the device is a full speed or high speed. Another interesting point is that if you are using uh, as your USB device a PIC microcontroller as you should, these uh, uh, pull-ups are actually internal and enabled by software. That makes uh, your design more uh, simple and economical. Oh. Going into more details about the communication, uh, a device uses uh, to exchange data buffers, uh, for example, locations in RAM uh, that are called endpoints, uh, EPs for short. There are two types of endpoints. Uh, remember that the USB is a host centering. Every, everything is referred to the host. So an out endpoint uh, will be an endpoint used to store data received from the host, while uh, an in endpoint uh, will be an endpoint uh, to, to store data to be sent to the host. Now remember that the device uh, cannot send any data to the host un unless the host uh, requested this uh, data first. And we will see some examples uh, later. There are two endpoints, endpoint zero, endpoint number zero in and endpoint number zero out uh, that are very important and they are used uh, during enumeration, as soon as the device is reset uh, after uh, uh, being plugged uh, into the bus, uh, these two endpoints uh, will be enabled and used uh, during the following process. Other endpoints uh, with numbers other than zero will be accessible after the enumeration, are usually grouped uh, into interfaces uh, and uh, will be used uh, for communication. Like for example, that little guy over there, our MCP bridge, uh, uh, it offers different uh, type of interfaces uh, for different purposes uh, to control uh, um, 
UART to USB bridge to access other information, like for example, I square C. And uh, this is an example of a device that will have endpoint zero in and out and endpoint uh, with different numbers as we will see during the next uh, uh, slides. The way the host exchanges data with the devices uh, is uh, structured uh, in a different uh, transfer types. And the USB 2.0 has uh, four different uh, transfer types. Control transfer, interrupt transfer, bulk transfer, and isochronous uh, transfer. Now remember when I said uh, that uh, the actual uh, payload transfer is uh, rate uh, is uh, less than uh, the bit rate, uh, uh, according to the USB specification, uh, there are uh, ideal cases uh, for uh, the actual uh, data throughput uh, per endpoint uh, using a given transfer type. Ideal because it assumes uh, that there is only that uh, device on the bus uh, and there aren't other devices competed, so, so to speak, uh, for bandwidth. Now, it seems, it seems kind of difficult. You have uh, four different transfer types uh, to choose uh, um, among. Uh, for your device? Uh, well, it's not actually that uh, complex because in most cases uh, you will have uh, to consider only interrupt or bulk transfers for your device because the control transfers are used by the host uh, during device configuration. So it's a kind of a specialized uh, transfer type that's usually not used uh, during the actual communication. And uh, the uh, device configuration is mostly taken care of by the host uh, uh, lower layers. And the isochronous transfers are typically used for real-time application, streaming applications. They have no error connections because uh, uh, they are real-time. So if you lose any frame or of every information, there is no point resending it. And um, typically, they are not used in embedded application unless you have a very high MIPS. So typically, you are choosing interrupt or bulk transfers. And what's the rule of thumb? Interrupt transfers will be used uh, when latency matters uh, because uh, they guarantee a maximum latency through polling. Uh, think, for example, to uh, a mouse. You want uh, to be able to track the movement, the position of the mouse, and if there is a button clicked on it. Uh, and once again, the mouse is a device, so it cannot send anything to the host if not asked to. But you don't also want uh, to be too late uh, uh, detecting the movement or the button press uh, on the mouse. So what the host, uh, the host does in this case uh, for interrupt transfers is basically to keep polling the mouse uh, with a frequency that's uh, specified by the mouse itself uh, during enumeration in order to detect the data. Bulk transfers uh, will be used when uh, throughput matters, when you wanted to send a lot of data, like for example in the case of the USB thumb drive. So as you can see, the maximum data payload for endpoint is actually maybe lower than interrupt transfers, but these type of transfers, the bulk transfers, are actually scheduled over the available bandwidth. As soon as there is possibility to send or receive data using uh, uh, bulk transfers, the host uh, will do it. And that's the reason why overall you have a, a higher throughput. So interrupt or bulk transfers. Now the implementer forum defines uh, some device typologies or device classes based on the transfer type or types used and also the data formatting. There are many, many classes. They are added uh, pretty much every day to the USB implementer forum uh, to uh, follow up uh, with uh, the technology development. But the most common classes um, are HID, that stands for Human Interface Device, uh, that uses interrupt transfers. Example of HID uh, device is a mouse. Uh, typically, the data logger are also HID devices because, uh, for example, we have a demo that we will see during the class uh, where you can uh, detect uh, the, state, uh, the status of uh, a switch button on the board or read uh, the value of the potentiometer on the board. So every board that basically behaves uh, like a control panel or a data logger can use an HID type of uh, class. And our PK3, by the way, is also an HID device. 
Another possible class uh, is the MSD, Master Storage Device, uh, that uses bulk uh, transfers, uh, for example, external hard drive, uh, external uh, uh, USB thumb drive, they all use uh, um, bulk uh, transfers. The CDC class, uh, Communication Device, uh, uh, uses interrupt and bulk transfers and it's typically used for RS-232 replacement. If you have a legacy design where you are supposed to talk to your board using UART but now you have the problem that in the current laptops uh, there is no more uh, um, UART connector but only USB connector then you can put uh, a, a CDC class uh, on the board in order to work as a USB to UART bridge or you can use one of those little guys, the MCP bridges that are basically black boxes, no need for you to understand the firmware or to load any firmware in them. They just work as one end USB, the other end UART. When you plug it in into your computer, it's going to create a virtual COM port and you can write to this port from hyper terminal or whatever serial terminal that you had uh, as, a, as a legacy. If none of these classes uh, is good enough for you, transfer type or data formatting type, you can use uh, a custom a generic uh, class that's called the vendor class. And we have uh, a class here at Masters in order to better understand how to write a vendor type of application and related uh, Windows drivers. So. Now we know a little more about uh, the USB concept and uh, as microchip we are committed uh, to provide uh, the customers with uh, the tools uh, to get started uh, with their design uh, as soon as possible. We provide uh, both firmware and uh, hardware tools. So we have basically to start with the firmware two um, libraries. The first one is called the MLA and you can find it at that address uh, and uh, it works uh, for 8 and 16 bit microcontrollers and you have the Harmony framework that's another library that you can find at a different address <coughs> and it's going to target 32-bit uh, microcontrollers. Uh, both libraries uh, have USB demo projects as we will see and uh, these demo projects that are written in C will be support as a default uh, the basic uh, USB demo boards uh, as the one that I showed before and more that you can find uh, at that address. The recommendation when you want to start with your design is to start looking into the libraries, see which demo projects you can start with, go through the demo projects and see which demo board is supported, and then you can start using the demo board as a um, starting point that you know it's going to work. And you can, uh, we also provide the um, PCB layouts and the schematics for the board that you can copy for your own design. So you have a kind of a proven starting point. Uh, for example, uh, if, you, if we look into the Harmony, the 32-bit demos, uh, you can see that uh, there is a, a sub, once you install it, uh, there is a subfolder called the device uh, and inside uh, this uh, subfolder there are other folders uh, with the different demos uh, supporting different uh, USB classes. And the same goes uh, if your application is going to be a host instead of, instead of a device. Uh, we have another subfolder with different uh, type of uh, classes being uh, supported. Once you select uh, one of these projects uh, and you open our IDE MPLabX, uh, there is uh, a scroll down menu at the top left uh, of MPLabX uh, where you can select uh, the uh, demo board uh, that you want to use. As an example, the PIC32 starter kit that you see in the slide and that you see also on the table. That's a good starting point because uh, uh, this uh, kit uh, also has a debugger slash a programmer on board so you just need uh, to plug this kit uh, into your laptop running MPLabX uh, and you are good to go. So it's a pretty self-contained and economical and uh, good to go uh, solution. And I get a free beer from the PIC32 guys every time I see I say so. So what are some questions that we wanted to ask ourselves in order to select the right demo and get started. Well, first of all, 
do I need a device or do I need a host? Is my design going to be plugged into an existing USB bus, so it's a device, or it's going to create its own USB bus, so it's going to be a host? And if it's a device, what are the communication needs? Is it something that I can fit into HID or MSD or CDC, or I need a vendor class? And uh, if it's a host, uh, which device class uh, we need uh, to be connected? That's important because, uh, for, for an example, uh, if you're familiar with those uh, USB to UART bridges by FTDI, it's a USB to UART, right? So you are expecting it to be a CDC device. That's actually not the case. Uh, FTDI chose uh, to uh, make it a vendor class and right now our host solution do not support vendor class so before committing to a given design you wanted to make sure to know exactly which device class you will have to support this is a pop quiz to see if you were paying attention what is an in and point it's a buffer on the device that used to store data to be sent to the host when requested What's the meaning of self-powered device? It's a device that's going to sync power from VBUS and an external power supply. And as we said, typically that really means from an external power supply only monitoring VBUS to see if there is a voltage on it. What is an interface? An interface is a set of non-zero endpoints used for communication. If you remember, the zero endpoints are used during enumeration and configuration of the device. Non-zero endpoints will be used for communication. So you started with your design. You made up your mind about which kind of class you wanted to use. You selected a demo project, either in the MLA or in Harmony, and selected a demo board, and hopefully, the demo project worked uh, from the beginning. Then you started modifying the code and um, said but true, eventually it will break. The code will no longer work, meaning that uh, the device is no longer getting enumerated or no longer communicating with the host. What do you do? Well, a good starting point uh, to debug the issue, the issue is to actually monitor the communication between the host and the device. If the device is no longer enumerating, if now it appears as unknown device in the device manager, what happens when the enumeration process uh, broke down? If uh, your GUI can no longer communicate with the device, uh, where is the problem? Can you see messages sent from the host to the device uh, but no answer or the other way around? And in order to do that, uh, it's good to use a bus analyzer. And that brings us uh, to the next section of our presentation, traffic on the bus. So the protocol analyzer or bus analyzer is a tool uh, that can be put between host and device uh, to capture the traffic and display it uh, graphically in a GUI. And uh, there are different uh, brands of bus analyzers. Uh, here at Masters, we have a booth from Total Phase and Teledyne LeCroix. They both have their own solutions and they are nice people, so you can visit them and check what's their offer and uh, prices. But the general idea, no matter what you choose, is, as I said, to put the protocol analyzer between host and device. So for example, you wanted to connect the protocol analyzer to the GUI using an upstream connection. Then you'll connect the host to the protocol analyzer, again with an upstream connection, and the device to the protocol analyzer with the downstream connection. Now, as you notice, I used uh, the same color for GUI and host uh, because in some cases, uh, the two entities uh, could be in the same machine. For example, if I wanted to monitor the traffic between a host, a GUI that's running on my laptop and a device uh, uh, such as uh, a USB board, uh, I'm just going to plug uh, the device uh, into my laptop that's going to be the host uh, and uh, the protocol again uh, into another USB port uh, of a laptop uh, and this is going to be connected uh, to the GUI. If uh, I wanted to see the traffic uh, between an embedded host uh, and the device, uh, then I'll have uh, the protocol analyzer between 
host and device embedded boards and the protocol analyzer plugged into my laptop where the GUI is running. By the way, at the moment, uh, the Total Phase solution supports both Windows and Mac OS and I believe also Linux, while the um, Teledyne LaCroix solution only supports Windows, just FYI. And as I said, uh, in this uh, class, uh, we are using a Mercury T2 analyzer from Teledyne LaCroix, and uh, its GUI captures and displays the traffic uh, in uh, a graphic color-coded format. It's also interesting to notice that the traffic, the transaction, the transfers uh, will be broken down uh, in simpler transactions and in simpler packets, uh, like this. This is an example of uh, a transfer being uh, captured and color-coded by the Mercury GUI. I can actually use uh, the menu on the GUI in order to break, break down uh, the, this transfer into simpler transaction. And uh, again, uh, I can break down uh, the transaction in packets. And as you can see, there are different information uh, that you can immediately see, like for example, the speed of the device, uh, full speed or high speed. Uh, and you can also detect uh, the direction of the packet uh, from host to device or from to device to host, uh, and additional information like the purpose of the transfer or the actual data in the packet, etc. In order to better understand the traffic, uh, we'll uh, take uh, a bottom-up uh, approach. So first, uh, we will look at the packets. Then we will see how the packets combine in order to form a transactions and the transfers. There are different packet types. Let's uh, first list them and then uh, look uh, into some details. First type is a token packet. Uh, you, can, uh, you can have an in, out, or setup token packet to start a transaction. You can have a start of frame token packet that is used as a time base and a keep alive on the bus. What does it mean? Well, first of all, uh, the transfers are scheduled uh, over the bandwidth uh, using frames uh, that are one milliseconds long for uh, low speed and full speed, uh, 125 microseconds long for high speed. The uh, ticks for these uh, frames uh, is provided by the start of frame packets. Also, as you remember, if the device uh, doesn't see any activity on the bus uh, after three milliseconds, it goes into suspend mode. To avoid the device into going into suspend mode just because there is no communication on the traffic but on the bus, but the bus is not idle, the start of frame packets are also used as a keep alive on the bus. Another type of packet is the data packet that's going to have uh, the actual data payload. And there are two types of data packets with ID data zero and data one that are alternated so that the receiving unit can tell uh, if there was something missing from the communication. After a data zero packet, it expects a data one packet. If there is another data zero packet, it assumes that a packet got lost. Another type of uh, packet is the handshake packet. There are ACK, NAC, or STALL packets that report the outcome of a transaction. And there are special packet types that are used for high speed. The S split, start split, and the C split, complete split are used for the split transactions, the, the one used by the hubs in order to communicate with, for example, a full speed device at full speed, but with the host still at a high speed device. And we will see an example of um, how the uh, split packets are used during these uh, transactions. Also, ping and yet packets are used by bulk transfers at high speed. And again, we will see a, pack a capture of the traffic to show uh, the sequence of these uh, packets. All these uh, uh, token data and special packets, except uh, NET, have a checksum protection using a CRC cyclic redundancy check. And the way it works uh, is that uh, the CRC is calculated by the sending unit uh, 
and when the receiving unit receives it, uh, it calculates again at the CRC. If there is a CRC fail, the packet is just ignored uh, by the receiver. And that makes uh, the USB bus uh, pretty uh, resistant to noise, combined with uh, the differential signal on the plus and the minus. If you are um, interested about the uh, low-level hardware signaling details, uh, we also have another classes with also some references uh, to best practices for PCB and hardware design. Another pop quiz. Uh, the point of this pop quiz uh, is uh, to get you a little more familiar about uh, the uh, graphical color-coded interface of the bus analyzer. What can you tell about uh, this packet looking at uh, the capture? Well, you can tell that it's a neck, so it's a handshake type of packet. It's going to be sent from the device to the host, and it's a high-speed communication. What about this packet? It's an in token, it's a host to device, and high-speed, again, communication. This packet is a data one data, device to host, high-speed communication. On top of that, if you hover over the, uh, pe the fields of the packet, you can have uh, pop-ups uh, from the analyzer with additional information. The first uh, transfer type uh, that uh, we'll uh, look into to see how the packets are combined uh, is the control transfer, because uh, it's kind of important. It's used during the device enumeration to send to the device a request uh, to either provide uh, configuration data. Now, uh, you are uh, uh, asking for data to the device, so an endpoint zero because of enumeration in will be used. Or uh, the um, uh, request can be sent uh, to accept a configuration settings. And in this case, uh, you will use uh, endpoint zero out. How are the control transfer uh, structured? They have. Uh, up to three stages. Each stage is made of one or more transactions. The first stage is the setup stage. Then you have an optional data stage and a status stage. The first stage, the setup stage, has only one transaction. In these diagrams, the gray background will be host to device and the white background will be device to host. So the setup stage starts with a setup packet in order to indicate a request being sent by the host to the device. It continues with a data packet to specify which request is it. And it ends if there is no CRC failure with an acknowledge for transaction successful from the device to the host. If there was any CRC failure, the device just ignores uh, the request and the host has to resend it. Up to three times. After three times, the host will notify the, the GUI on your computer that there is something wrong. The second and optional data stage uh, is uh, used to receive the data requested or to send uh, the settings. And you can have one Sorry, can have more than one transaction according to how many data you needed to exchange. So it starts with an in packet followed by data being sent from the device to the host and an acknowledge to the host and possibly other similar data transaction for additional data. If uh, another possibility after the in initial packet uh, is uh, for the device uh, to reply with uh, an ACK, saying that the endpoint uh, is not ready to accept uh, the IN uh, token. Another possibility after the IN uh, uh, token is uh, to have uh, a stall packet. It means uh, that the endpoint uh, is uh, halted, meaning it's a, in a condition that needs an additional processing by the host, typically a reset, or maybe that uh, the request uh, was uh, correct, uh, CRC-wise, uh, but not supported by the device. That's the case of uh, an in data. Similarly, for an out data, you start uh, with uh, an out uh, packet, uh, 
a data packet being sent from the host to the device and the device is going to acknowledge the transaction some uh, out data transfers can happen or you can have a NAC from the device or a stall from a device it's a very simple to understand the structure it's basically a communication some data if they're provided or received and uh, the conclusion of the transaction and finally the status stage is used to report the outcome of the control transfer request it has only one transaction that really depends on the data stage if there was an in data stage you have an out packet being sent from the host to the device uh, followed by a data packet that has zero byte it's characteristic of this stage and the device will reply with an ACK when the request from the host has been completed or there could be an ACK if the request is still pending or a stall if the endpoint is halted or the request again is not supported if the data stage was out or there was no data stage you can have an in packet from the host to the device followed by a data packet and acknowledge from the host to the device if the request was executed or again an ACK or a stall exactly with the same uh, meaning of before let's see this uh, uh, traffic uh, on uh, the bus analyzer this control transfer can be broken down uh, in setup and status uh, stages in this case there is no da data stage the setup stage uh, and that's a transaction number 57 in the capture has uh, these three packets as described previously this uh, status uh, stage uh, transaction 58 uh, has uh, these uh, three packets a more complex example for this control transfer that actually has all the three stages setup data and status and the data stage uh, since we already went uh, through the other ones uh, can be broken down uh, in the three packets as described and the status stage again has the same structure that we are expecting but uh, as you can notice uh, the color coding and all the additional fields uh, make the thing uh, a little more simple to uh, follow imagine if you had uh, to follow this uh, traffic uh, as a bit stream instead of uh, a more abstract color coding uh, uh, representation another pop quiz Which endpoint can receive a control transfer request? The answer is endpoint zero, either in or out. In for data to be sent to the host, out for data to be um, sent from the host. What's the minimum number of transactions in a control transfer request? Two. One for the setup stage, one for the status stage. Remember, there is another optional stage in between, uh, that is the data stage. We will circle back to control transfers when talking about the device configuration. But uh, now let's consider the next type of transfer, the interrupt transfer. The structure of the interrupt transfer is much simpler than uh, the control transfers. Once again, uh, gray background is host to device uh, white background uh, the other way around so the in uh, transaction basically starts uh, with a packet from the host uh, to the device followed by a data packet uh, data 0 or data 1 uh, according to the size of the endpoint uh, and uh, an acknowledge from uh, the host uh, to the device uh, Another possibility, after the in packet, there could be an ACK from the data. Example, uh, the host is your computer and the device is your mouse. If you're not moving the mouse, the mouse has no new, new data for the computer. So the computer will keep polling, as described previously, the device to check, the mouse to check if there are new data, but uh, 
that are known. So in this case, uh, we will see a sequence of in packet from the host uh, to the mouse, and the mouse will keep repeating knack, 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 because there are new data. And uh, there could also be a situation where the device uh, is replying with a stall because the endpoint is in a halted uh, condition. The out interrupt transaction is also pretty simple. There is uh, an out packet being sent from the host to the device. The access to the endpoint is still uh, uh, limited by the frequency of polling specified during the enumeration. A data zero or one packet being sent from the host to the device and uh, an acknowledge from the device to the host if all went well. You can also have uh, a NAC uh, if there are no data or a store. Let's see an example. Uh, among the demos uh, that the MLA uh, offers, uh, there is an HID class uh, demo where you have uh, a GUI that you can use uh, to toggle an LED or to read the state of, of a push button on that uh, squared board, uh, the one with the PK-18 on it. Let's see what, uh, uh, what's the corresponding bus uh, traffic. First of all, to toggle the LED on the board. So initially, when the GUI is idle, you are not uh, touching it, uh, you have the host uh, that keeps uh, pulling the in uh, interrupt endpoint, uh, endpoint one in, in this case, uh, and keeps receiving NAC uh, as uh, previously described. But as soon as a uh, toggle LED is pressed, uh, you have uh, uh, interrupt out transfer to endpoint one out in this case uh, to toggle the LED. Let's see the case of uh, getting the push button state. Now, when uh, you press uh, that button on the GUI, first uh, you send a transfer to the device uh, to endpoint one out uh, in this case. Uh, to put the push button state uh, in endpoint one in. And then uh, you will have an interrupt in a transfer being sent to endpoint in one to retrieve the push button state. So if you are actually operating this GUI and uh, the board uh, with uh, the bus analyzer, you can actually see this uh, sequence and understand uh, if everything is going on. Uh, if there is a problem, what's the problem? The host to the device or the other way around? Last type of transfer in this presentation is uh, the bulk transfer. And uh, the in and out transactions are exactly like the one that we've seen for the interrupt transfer. The only difference is uh, the uh, high speed out transfer, because uh, in this case, uh, there is an additional protocol called the ping protocol. The purpose of the ping protocol is uh, to avoid waste of bandwidth uh, with uh, the host uh, sending out uh, an out uh, token followed by a data zero packet uh, to get an act uh, by the device. So basically the host is telling the device, I have data for you, and the device says, I have no time to process it, please resend. It's a waste of bandwidth. So with the ping protocol, uh, the device uh, can answer to an out uh, data zero or one transaction with a not yet packet. That means uh, that the current data packet is accepted, but uh, the device asks the host uh, to get uh, pinged uh, and acknowledge uh, this ping uh, before the next uh, data transfer attempt. And uh, to give you an example based on our actual uh, uh, MacChip solutions, uh, the uh, Harmony has uh, um, MSD uh, mass storage device uh, demo that basically uses uh, the flash memory of the PIC32, that big uh, starter kit uh, close to the bus analyzer, in order to emulate uh, a logical SCSI storage. And we can see how the ping protocol uh, works. We first have an out uh, followed by an yet, and that means uh, that the next uh, uh, transfer will be an ACK uh, followed by a ping and then data out, exactly as expected. Last, uh, we, I, I just wanted to, to give you a quick visualization of how those uh, split transaction works uh, with the hubs. Uh, this is a picture of another example of an embedded hub that microchip sells. 
So on the left, uh, you have the host. On the right, uh, you have uh, a low speed or full speed device. And uh, yeah, the packets uh, will, be, will have a blue background uh, if it's high speed or a green background uh, if it's a low speed or full speed. Sorry about the sorry for the color blinded, but uh, basically the uh, high speed communication will be on the left and uh, the full speed communication will be on the right. So what happens is that uh, the host sends to the hub uh, a start split packet that's followed by the actual in packet, and now the burden goes uh, to the hub that manages the rest of the traffic without uh, having the host waiting for an answer from the lower speed device. So the hub will resend the in packet but at the lower speed to the device, will wait for the data to the device and if all went well acknowledge this data. The host when bandwidth available will keep sending complete split request to the hub and when the hub received the data from the device will actually resend the in packet and reply to the host. So it's basically the concept is basically an outsourcing of the lower speed communication to the hub not to reduce uh, the speed of the communication of the um, overall bus. As we said, when you plug in a device, uh, there is uh, quite the initial traffic uh, on the bus uh, with all the information related uh, to the device uh, capabilities and requirements. So it's interesting uh, to look into it uh, in some more details. And that brings us uh, to the next uh, uh, section of our presentation, that is the device enumeration. The device enumeration happens uh, in uh, precise uh, steps. First of all, uh, the device uh, is uh, plugged uh, into a downstream port uh, of a uh, hub. And when the device is plugged in, uh, it detects uh, the VBUS voltage and asserts the pull up to 3.3 volt on either D plus or D minus according to the speed. The device attachment this way is detected by the hub and the hub starts a signaling protocol on D plus and D minus to reset the device and if necessary establish if the device is full speed or high speed, the so-called chirp protocol that you can see in the other class I was referring to. At this point, uh, the endpoint uh, zero that are used uh, during enumeration are enabled and the host uh, can use uh, some control transfers uh, to send requests to the device, uh, either to read the device uh, communication and power requirements uh, or to assign a unique address uh, to the device uh, and accept uh, the device requirements is uh, sustainable if the host has enough bandwidth for the communication needs of the device and enough power for the power needs of the device. At the end of this process, the device interface or interfaces are enabled and the actual communication can start. All the information that are exchanged during this process and are needed to the host during enumeration are stored in the device using data structure that are called the descriptors. And there are uh, basically two types of descriptors, the standard descriptors that are common to every device uh, and the class descriptors that are specific uh, to the class uh, that are described in the class specifications that you can find uh, in the uh, USB implementer forum website uh, and that are not going to be covered in this presentation. That's more about a general uh, um, USB concept. So, Focusing on the standard descriptors, they are a device descriptor, only one per device. Then you have one or more configuration descriptors, at least one anyway per device. For every configuration descriptor, you have one or more interface descriptors. And for every interface descriptor, you have one or more endpoint descriptors. So the descriptors are kind of organized uh, in a hierarchical way so that the host uh, can read all the possibilities uh, offered or requested by the device uh, during the enumeration. 
There are also some optional string descriptors that uh, can provide the human readable information, like for example, the serial number. Um, like for example, the PICI3 serial number, or you can give a serial number to one of our boards when you are programming the USB firmware. Each descriptor has several fields. You can uh, refer to the USB specification uh, to see all the possible fields and, and the details uh, and the meaning, but uh, for our purposes, to get a general understanding, uh, uh, operational understanding of how USB works, uh, these are the fields that are usually more relevant. Starting with the device descriptor, there is a field uh, that specifies what's the class code of the device, HID, MSD, CDC, etc. If this uh, field uh, is as the number zero, that means uh, that the device has uh, uh, the device class is specified in the interface descriptor, as we will see later. It will also have uh, a field to specify what's the maximum packet size for M.0, and that will tell you if a given data transfer can be done in one transaction or multiple transactions. And it will have the vendor ID, BID, that we previously described, uh, and the product ID, PID. It will also uh, tell you how many configurations are for these devices. Why do you need multiple configurations? Think, for example, to a DVD player that can also burn DVDs. Typically, you don't need much power in order to read the DVD, but you need more power in order to burn uh, the DVD. So in this case, uh, this device uh, could have one configuration that's bus powered. It only reads the data from, uh, sorry, it only gets the power from the bus uh, in case uh, you don't have a way to connect an external power supply. And in this case, uh, if the host chooses this configuration, your GUI will have the section of burning the DVD grayed out because this is not available in this configuration. A second configuration will actually be self-powered and be able to burn the uh, DVD. And if the host chooses this configuration, you will be able to access this uh, section on your GUI. So the configuration descriptor will have uh, the number of interfaces in this configuration. As we've seen previously, the non-zero endpoint can be organized in different uh, interfaces for different communication capabilities. Uh, you will have the value used by the host to select this configuration. The indication if uh, uh, the device is self-powered or bus-powered, and if the remote wake up, the capability to get out of suspend mode is enabled or not. And uh, the maximum current sunk from VBus uh, after configuration. Remember, for USB 2.0, that's up to 500 milliamp. The interface descriptor will have uh, the number of this interface uh, used during communication and uh, the number of the endpoints, known and zero endpoint, uh, in this interface. If uh, the class of the device uh, wasn't specified in the device descriptor or if there are multiple classes uh, supported by this uh, um, device uh, and so the uh, class uh, needs to be specified uh, in the interface descriptor, in this uh, field uh, you will have uh, the interface uh, class code as specified by the implementer forum. Last but not least, uh, we have the endpoint uh, descriptor that will specify the endpoint number and direction of data transfer respect to the host. The communication between the host and the device is per se bidirectional, as we have seen previously. There are some packets being sent from the host to the device and packets being sent from the device to the host. But the data payload the transfer is only one direction. It's either in or out. And that's specified in this field of the endpoint descriptor. You also have a field uh, indicating which, can, which transfer type uh, is used by the endpoint, uh, interrupt, uh, bulk, uh, or uh, isochronous. The maximum data packet size for this endpoint, uh, and uh, what uh, for the interrupt endpoints, uh, the endpoint access period in frames or microframes, one millisecond or 125 uh, microseconds. Let's see an example. For example, in this specific case, uh, 
we have a device uh, with uh, VID 0x048 and that would be microchip as we said uh, and uh, this PID only having one configuration. This specific configuration descriptor will indicate that the device is bus powered and it's requesting uh, to be able to sync uh, up to 500 milliamps uh, from the host. The remote wake up uh, is requested to be enabled and uh, it only has one interface. This interface uh, implements the HID class uh, and uses uh, two endpoints. And uh, one of the endpoints uh, is going to be an in endpoint uh, supporting an interrupt transfer type, uh, no surprise uh, since uh, the interface is HID class uh, with a 64 byte buffer and uh, a poll every 3 milliseconds. If we wanted to follow the enumeration using uh, the bus analyzer, we can see that at the beginning of the enumeration, the host uh, does assign a unique address to the device uh, using the set address standard request. That is actually uh, highlighted in the um, packet capture. And to read uh, the standard descriptors, the one common to every device, uh, the host uh, will use uh, a standard request uh, got, uh, called the get descriptor get descriptor can read a single descriptor as in this case or it can read multiple descriptor what usually the host does is after reading the device descriptor it reads the configuration descriptor along with the interface and related endpoint descriptors and once and if a sustainable device configuration is read the host will enable it sending to the device a set configuration standard request uh, that concludes the enumeration and uh, the packet analyzer will also tell you which configuration number has been selected. If there is no sustainable device configuration you will see you will still see a set configuration uh, uh, request uh, with uh, uh, configuration number zero meaning that the host uh, couldn't configure the device. What that means uh, is that uh, your device is requesting something not available to the host, so you need to change the device descriptor or the device design in order to meet uh, the actual capabilities of your, uh, of your host. Another pop quiz about the device enumeration. Can the host communicate with the device if the device enumeration failed and why? But the answer is no, because the device interfaces that are the collection of endpoints, non-zero endpoint used during uh, communication are enabled at the end of a successful enumeration. So, so if the host cannot enumerate the device, it cannot communicate with it. Can the device implement more than one class? Yes, and we have an example there on the board. The little, uh, the little guy is an HID plus a CDC device. Oh, and also we have demos in our MLA and Harmony implementing, for example, HID plus MSD or CDC plus MSD demos. The next section will talk about uh, Windows drivers. When uh, you are plugging in your device uh, into a Windows machine, uh, it can happen uh, that uh, there is a pop-up window referring to a driver being installed uh, or asking for a driver to be provided. What are we talking about? Windows drivers. The basic, basic idea is that uh, a processor running a Windows operating system can be in either one of two modes uh, according to uh, the execution happening. So you can have a user mode used by applications or uh, a kernel mode that used for core operating system components. So a Windows driver is a file with the .sys extension that is a kernel mode component uh, supporting a specific uh, USB class. For example, you have the USB ser.sys uh, used by CDC, the HID class.sys used by HID, and uh, the USB store.sys as a storage uh, used by the MSD. So basically what happens is that the basic uh, operating system core takes care of the initial steps of the enumeration, generic, valid for every USB device, uh, and then uh, the driver gets loaded uh, based on the type, uh, on the class of the device uh, that's read by the descriptors. 
and uh, uh, continuous the enumeration. Another type of uh, uh, driver is uh, the WinUSB. Uh, it's a vendor type of driver, and uh, if uh, you use the, our tools, uh, you might be familiar with it uh, because uh, it's uh, the driver that we currently use uh, for our ICD trees, Realize, uh, and uh, uh, it's loaded uh, along with, uh, uh, it's installed uh, along with MPLAB X. We can also use uh, a user mode component uh, that exposes an application programming interface and API used so that an application can access uh, the driver. And this uh, component, uh, it's called DLR, Dynamic -like Link Library. So for example, that little guy, the MCP2221, uh, offers uh, two interfaces, uh, UART interface uh, and uh, an HID interface. The first one uh, is a USB to UART bridge, uh, and uh, this driver, USB sir.sys, uh, will create a virtual COM port that uh, you can access without uh, having an additional DLL installed. But uh, the other interface uh, will be an HID interface uh, that used by the USB to I2C bridge. And in this case, uh, in the download page uh, of uh, the MC, uh, MCP part, uh, you can actually download uh, uh, a DLL with uh, um, I2C read and write related functions as uh, per the screenshot. Depending on the device class uh, and which version of Windows you are using, uh, 7, 8, uh, 10, uh, it could be necessary to point the operating system through a dialog window to a text file that's called INF information file. And this file lists a series of VID and PID and associates them to a specific uh, Windows driver. More specifically, for HID and MSD, there is no INF needed. And that's one of the reasons why when we first released the PICI3, programmer, we uh, implemented it using an HID class uh, because uh, we thought that it was mostly supported by no matter which version of Windows uh, you had. For the Win USB, the driver currently used by Realize uh, and uh, ICD3, there is no NF needed uh, if using Windows 8 uh, according that you add uh, some uh, specific descriptors that are called Microsoft OS descriptors. And there is, uh, in our, in our um, help and guidelines, uh, there are some uh, example about it. For the CDC slash ACM class, uh, no INF uh, is needed starting with uh, Windows 10. Now, as an example, circling back uh, to the uh, to our MLA, when you install the MLA, you also have uh, an INF file that are called MCHP CDC. And uh, as you can guess, uh, it's going to be used uh, to associate a specific pairs of VID and PID to the USB uh, serial driver that's used for uh, UR emulation. Now, if uh, an IF, uh, INF file needed to be provided, Microsoft required a driver signature in order to trust uh, this uh, driver. This driver signature involves uh, you buying a certificate from a certificate authority, and that's like 166 bucks a year. It requires you to download uh, from the Microsoft Developer Network a tool that's called the Windows Driver Kit and use it uh, to generate a specific file called the CAT catalog file. But our demos in does include signed drivers, so you can uh, start uh, without uh, a need uh, to go through this additional process. But if you are changing anything in the INF, for example, if you are getting the PID uh, via our sub-licensing program, then you will need uh, to sign again uh, the driver going mm, through that process. Uh, the MLA help file has uh, a full section with uh, a detailed description of the process, the tools, the steps, etc., etc. Let's talk about the device certification. As uh, I said at the beginning, a certification means uh, to double check that the device uh, matches with uh, uh, the official USB specification. And that's why it's also called the compliance uh, testing. 
you can get more details uh, and find out the additional tools at this uh, main page from the USB implementer forum and the question is uh, do I need to go through certification well it's not required to sell your device but the USB implementer forum has a USB logo the one that looks like a trident and if you want to put the USB IF logo on your device then you need to go through the certification it's also good uh, uh, to go through certification uh, mm, for uh, liability in order to make sure that your device matches the official specification the certification is released by USB IF recognized labs that are listed there and uh, it's not cheap because uh, fail or success uh, it pays um, it costs more than 1500 bucks uh, to get a certification so it's probably a good idea to understand uh, what are the steps of, of the certification and understand if you can go through these steps uh, at home so to speak uh, before trying uh, and uh, sending your device uh, to the certification labs the first step is to download from that address what's called the peripheral compliance checklist. It's basically a list of questions with the checkboxes and related chapters from the specification. You go through this list and you are supposed to be able to answer yes every time. If not, you need to circle back to your design or firmware and change it accordingly. The second step uh, goes uh, through a tool uh, that's called the USB 2.0 command verifier that you can download uh, from the implementer forum and this tool will send uh, to the target device uh, a set of requests uh, in order to test the compliance with the standard control request and current uh, uh, draw specification. What you are you're going to see is just a list of uh, pass, 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 pass or fail uh, if it fails. There is also an additional step uh, that is uh, the signal quality test for D plus and D minus but the reason why I grade it out is that it requires a very very expensive oscilloscope that's going to provide uh, the so-called eye diagram so uh, it's typically something that uh, you, you cannot do at home so only the first two steps are mm, suggested and uh, once you go successfully through the first two steps then you can send your device to the lab and uh, cross your fingers so time to recap what we discussed today and also see some references for additional learning and see if there is uh, any additional doubt uh, questions etc so in order to wrap up what we covered today is usb 2.0 concepts and terminology what are the basic idea that we need uh, in order to be able to select uh, a demo from either the MLA or Harmony and to select uh, a demo board for it. We also uh, saw that a protocol analyzer can abstract uh, the bitstream uh, going on the bus uh, in order to give us uh, a lot of useful information about uh, characteristics and requirements of the device uh, and uh, what's going on between the host, uh, the GUI on our host and the device. And we specifically looked uh, at uh, one possible protocol analyzer among the many available and also shown uh, here at Masters. We've seen some implementation examples, we've seen how to use uh, the flash uh, memory on a microcontroller to emulate uh, um, a thumb drive, we saw how to uh, talk uh, to a board, uh, toggling LED, reading the status of an LED, and we tried to figure out uh, what's the main difference between host uh, and device applications. We went uh, through device certification to figure out if uh, we wanted to go through it uh, and the expense uh, of it uh, or not. Uh, and uh, it's also interesting to know that most of these tools, but not the bus analyzers, will be available here at Masters at the Development Tools Store with a nice uh, discount. Uh, that uh, squared demo board, uh, the PK-10F45J53 uh, uh, PIM, has uh, that part number and I also provided the part number of the um, high-speed starter kit. You can see at the Teledyne Lacroix booth uh, the Mercury T2 protocol analyzer, or you can go to the Total Phase booth uh, and see the big old USB analyzer, compare the two, see which uh, GUI uh, you find yourself more comfortable with, uh, compare the prices, etc., uh, etc. 
And as I was saying, uh, there are several references uh, provided by microchip or outside microchip that you can uh, uh, use uh, to learn more about USB or to get uh, help uh, if uh, you have uh, any problems. Uh, one book that's very popular talking about USB is uh, USB Complete, that's now at the fifth edition. Um, word of advice, uh, right now it covers uh, the most recent USB specification, that is USB 3.1, along with uh, USB 2.0. So when going through it, uh, you might want to be careful and figure out uh, if the concept you're learning applies uh, to USB 3.1 only or also to USB 2.0. But it's a pretty complete book that also goes uh, through all the layers, uh, um, hardware, uh, firmware, and also PC development. You can go to the USB implementer forum to see specification, certification tools, uh, and uh, events, uh, fairs uh, that you can go through and uh, learn more and mm, meet other developers. And of course, there is microchip technical support uh, that uh, you can reach at this address. You uh, just need to log in, register or log in using Microchip Direct login, for example. You can enter a request of technical support that's called a case, describe your case and uh, get an answer from it through email or through phone according to the type of problem. There is also a forum on our microchip uh, uh, website uh, that's not officially monitored by us, uh, but there are a lot of smart people uh, frequenting the forum, so it's also a good point uh, to um, share information, share experiences, etc., etc. And as I said, uh, there are many other classes at Masters in order to uh, gain a little more understanding of uh, the USB uh, 2.0 behavior. Uh, this class, uh, 20049 USB 2.0, is interesting if you want to learn a little more about the signaling of USB, uh, board design, uh, PCB best practices, battery charging, etc., uh, etc. Et this class, uh, USB 3.0, uh, gives you details about uh, a very popular uh, USB class uh, HID, and it's also a hands-on class, meaning that uh, you will have some boards uh, to work on, you will have some labs, uh, some code to write, uh, and uh, mm, you will be able to actually gain a hands-on experience on the HID class. USB 4 is about a vendor slash custom USB development, again, uh, it's an hands-on class, uh, not only for the firmware, the board side of the development, but also for the PC uh, software development. And it will give you also you some more information about driver development. USB 5 uh, will give you some information about uh, Harmony. If uh, your design uh, is going to use uh, PIC32, you might want uh, to attend uh, this class uh, to understand better how the Harmony framework uh, is uh, structured and how you can use it in order to implement uh, USB applications. USB 6 uh, will also be uh, focused on Harmony, but instead of uh, device, uh, it will focus on USB host applications. And last but not least, uh, USB 7 will be about the Type-C interface. There will be a technical overview uh, and uh, some uh, design best practices.